So I've left the statement of the theorem on the board so that uh, we can be sure to refer to it at any point in time when we're thinking about the proof of this theorem to keep in mind what our goal is. And we have a lot of goals. So let me just sketch out First, before we start tackling the proof, let's split it up into several steps. And we'll split it up into four steps. Because there are a lot of there's so many things we want to prove, we want to make sure that we understand what exactly we have to show at each of these steps. So the first step is show that F is locally one-to-one -one near C. What do I mean by this? What I mean by this is that there exists some open set around C. Let's call it U. Such that when I restrict F to this domain, then F is one-to-one. -one. So there exists IE there exists an open set U such that first F is U is small enough so that it's inside the domain of A so let me just say that C is in U is and this is, is a subset of A and F restricted to U is one to one that's the first step The second step is, by the way, we should make sure why this is, an ev this is even important in the first place. Um, if f wasn't one-to-one -one in some neighborhood, then this would mean that we can't even construct an inverse because even as a function, an inverse wouldn't exist. So we have to make sure that f is one-to-one -one on some domain so that we at least have a bijection from that domain to the, the range. So. Now, let's think about what the second step should be. If I already have a function, and I know it's one-to-one -one on some domain, then I know that I can construct an inverse of the image of that domain under that function. And one of the very important parts about the image of this function is, what would happen if the image is not an open set? Think about it. If I had a point C, and it maps to, let's see if I can sketch this somewhere here and it mapped to some f of c, right? I had this function f. Sorry, I'm drawing in the middle of my steps, but imagine I had this function f, and I mapped it to some neighborhood around f of c. If that neighborhood was not open, it wouldn't even make sense to ask if the inverse function is differentiable, because we don't know what the value of the function is at all points. And like I said earlier, Although you can make sense of a definition for what it means for a function to be differentiable on subsets that are not necessarily open, it doesn't make sense to define the differential of such a function because it might not be well defined. So before we even talk about differentiability, we have to make sure that there's some open set around the image of C that's also in the image of F. And it turns out that F of u is open in Rn. That should surprise you. The reason is because even if I have a continuous function, the image of uh, an open set under a continuous function need not be open. So step two is to prove that the image of u is open in Rn. And now that we know that f of u is open in Rn, we can at least make sense of continuity and differentiability. So that's the next part of the claim. So the next part is g, which is defined to be the inverse of f, which exists by step 1, is continuous on the entire domain, f u. So the third step is prove that the inverse is continuous. The fourth step, which is maybe obviously the final step, is to prove that the function is differentiable. 
So prove that g is differentiable at f of c. So all of these are prove. This is things that we would have to do to prove this theorem. Now, it's true that if we know that a function is differentiable on the entire domain, then it follows that it's continuous. But it turns out that if we try to prove this theorem by first trying to prove this, we'll see that we actually use a lot of, um, a lot of step three in the proof of step four. So even step one is already non-trivial, very much so. So let me just sketch out one important claim in step one that's needed to prove step one. So we'll think of this as a lemma. And it says that under the same assumptions as above, greater than zero and a delta greater than zero such that the difference of the values of these two functions at all points are greater than, and I, I, should, I shouldn't use the word, the letter delta, I should call this alpha instead. So let's call that alpha to be consistent with the notes. So there exists an alpha satisfying the following condition. That the difference of the value of the function at two nearby points is always going to be greater than the distance between those points multiplied by some positive, strictly positive factor for all x and y in the epsilon neighborhood around c. And we'll see that our open set u is very closely related to this one. Now, this is the claim. It's already highly non-trivial. And instead of proving it now, we'll just indicate why this lemma implies that, a function, that the function f is continuous in some neighborhood of c. So note that if x, if f of x is equal to f of y, then this inequality tells us that we have 0 is greater than or equal to alpha times x minus y, right? But alpha is positive, and if this was also positive, then this would violate that inequality because it would say that 0 is greater than or equal to some positive number. So by contradiction, this implies that x minus y must be 0. And if x minus y must be 0, then this implies, and in fact, here's an if and only if, x equals y. So this lemma proves that the function f is 1 to 1 on some open neighborhood, uh, and in particular we've chosen uh, a disk around C, uh, on which the function f is 1 to 1. And in the next video we'll indicate some of the other steps that are needed in the proof of this theorem.